In a remote area, away from the busy streets and endless traffic, Mrs. Parker lives by herself, but has a tenant in a barn, Clay, who's leading a quiet life as a beekeeper. One day, managing finances, Mrs. Parker gets a notification of a virus on her laptop. She calls the number displayed that connects her to a fishing company. The ringleader, Garnet, takes it upon himself to set an example to his trainees. He assures Mrs. Parker that the notification comes from the pre-installed package she installed on her laptop and advises her to update it. Since Mrs. Parker isn't a computer person, Garnet offers to do it for her, remotely. She just has to download a little program called Friendly Friend, granting him access. Just as she does, Garnet mutes the call, displaying to everyone in the company Mrs. Parker's checking, life insurance, pension and best of all, a charity account with $2 million in it. Garnet initiates strip mining, but at this point Mrs. Parker still doesn't suspect anything. Garnet assures her it's totally normal. What's more, because of the inconvenience, he promises to credit her back the subscription fee, supposedly transferring it to the account she manages. To verify the transfer, she attempts to log in and sees a transfer of 50000 It's all part of Garnet's scheme, using sympathy. Mrs. Parker baits, and using the master password attempts to wire back the money. This is where Garnet scores, emptying all her accounts in an instant, a great win for him. When Mrs. Parker's screen turns back on, all of her accounts are emptied. She can't believe it. Her phone starts popping off about fraudulent activities and the cruel realization starts to slowly set in. Meanwhile Clay is extracting that sweet honey, setting aside a jar for Mrs. Parker. In the evening he visits her to hand it over, but no one answers the door, so he lets himself in. The fire alarm is blaring and something is off. Walking into the next room, he finds a fired gun. He's suddenly ambushed and is told to drop to his knees by Verona, Mrs. Parker's daughter. Clay expresses his sympathy to her, Mrs. Parker has removed herself. At this point Clay is the main suspect, Verona refuses to accept her mother killing herself. He calmly answers the agent's questions, he was just bringing her a jar of honey. His story of being a beekeeper checks out. When Verona checks her mother's accounts, she figures that this might have been the reason for the early removal. GSR negative and Mrs. Parker's fingerprints on the gun, there is only one explanation. Verona apologizes for being a bit too harsh, but it's understandable. To get to know the person her mother lived with, she invites him for a cup of coffee. Verona reveals that Clay reminded her mother of Verona's deceased brother, a former Marine Raider. Mrs. Parker always gave him more praise for mowing the lawn than her graduating the FBI Academy. Verona reveals that someone emptied all of her mother's accounts. She got scammed. Verona talked with an agent from the Cyber Crimes Office. Supposedly the crew that got Mrs. Parker has been operating for years and they still don't have their names. She is pessimistic that they will ever be brought to justice. Clay compares stealing from elderly as like hurting a child, but worse, there is no parent to protect them. Either it goes unnoticed or nobody cares. Verona cares, she swears to seek retribution. Clay takes his leave, he has to take care of the hive. Also seeking justice for Mrs. Parker, Clay contacts the beekeepers, a secret group he retired from, asking for a favor in finding Garnet's crew. Not long after, Clay receives an address for the scammers, a call center run by Garnet. Arriving with two gas canisters, the security tells him to go back where he came from, but he's here to burn it down. Dismantling them with a one-two punch, he makes his way inside and grabs everyone's attention, asking them to repeat after him. I will never steal from the weak and the vulnerable again, but he's only met with laughter. Well there are other ways to make himself clear. This time no one's laughing. After they repeat the oath, he makes sure they keep the promise by pouring the gasoline everywhere. Garnet tries to stop him, but it's Clay's way of smoking the hornets to protect the hive. He easily deals with the five security guards, like a walk in the park for an ex-special agent, and continues to place bombs on the gas canisters that will trigger from the next call made to the center. Just as another family infected with the virus calls the center, Clay is already out and the place blows up. At Danforth Enterprises in Boston, the spoiled Derek Danforth himself receives a call from Garnet, notifying him about the disgruntled customer incident, explaining how Clay just tore through the security like a hot knife through butter and burned the place to the ground. A 30 mil building is now just a pile of rubble. The worst part is, they have no clue who did it. Derek has to big dog this one. He goes to his advisor, who ran a CIA back in his time, wondering if he can find and take care of Clay, but he wants no part of it. No biggie, Derek tells Garnet to log in into the cloud and look for anyone connected to the last few deals they closed. Then go American gangster on that fella. In an unsure voice, Garnet promises to get it done. A while later Verona gets to the scene, no one can identify the perpetrator, but she's internally celebrating a small victory against these a-holes. Back to where he belongs, Clay just enjoys his beekeeping. But it's just silence before the storm, Garnet arrives with his mercenaries at Mrs. Parker's place, noticing Clay driving off, Garnet wants to go eye for an eye, 
shooting up Clay's beehives. Hearing the shots, Clay activates multiple machines to mask the sound, with them arriving he lurks in the shadows, forcing them to fire in advance. Clay quietly dismantles Garnet's men one by one, by another one. The bad guys never learn not to separate. With Garnet left alone and in a state of panic seeing his men dead, it's a done deal. Clay severs the boy's fingers, leaving him alive to send a message. During the course of an investigation, Verona receives a notification about a fire at her mother's house, only to discover that the identified bodies are affiliated with the same company. It is at this point that everything starts to click for the agents, Clay is responsible for it. Garnet calls Derek while stopped at the bridge, interrupting his Monty Petty or whatever session expecting good news, but it's been a downward spiral. Just as Garnet is explaining that Clay is some kind of a beekeeper ninja, suddenly Clay drags Garnet out of the car, strapping him and sending him off the bridge. Picking up the phone, he lets Derek know, he's next, sending chills down the boy's spine. With this, he goes to his big dog, explaining that some mad beekeeper is after him, burned down one of his 20 call centers. It suddenly clicks for Wallace, a beekeeper? He knows Derek fucked up big time, unaware of the illegitimate aspects of his business. Derek doesn't understand why Wallace is so afraid of that fucking nobody. That fucking nobody, is a beekeeper. The beekeeper is a man of focus, commitment, sheer will, something Derek knows very little about. Being ex-CIA director, Wallace assures him that there is nothing he can do to help him. The FBI finally starts to piece the puzzle and are sure there must be a ringleader to all these fraudulent call centers. What's more of a mystery is Clay, he's invisible, the only thing they have on him is his birth certificate. The only explanation, he's in some sort of classified program. Jessica calls Wallace, begging him to look after her son, promising more shares in the company. That's all he wanted to hear. He rings up the, never call me on this line, line in the CIA, and with one mention of his dumb employer catching the attention of the beekeeper, she knows it's serious. He needs Janet's help. The manager of the special beekeeper program calls Wallace, informing him that Clay is a retired agent and the current active beekeeper is going to be taking things from here. Still, that doesn't set his mind at ease. Solemnly staring at his honey, Clay's car is rammed from behind. The psycho whips her gun and starts blasting, but Clay's already out. The police don't phase her and as Clay locks her neck, she finds it amusing. The two go at it, but somehow she struggles to match the unarmed Clay. No problem, a minigun will do the work, blasting the whole gas station. Clay whips out his jar of honey and just throws it at her, setting her on fire. Clay cuts off her finger before driving off. Subsequently, the beekeepers declare neutrality, leaving Wallace on his own. The FBI slowly catches up with Clay's antics, finding Garnet's body and arriving at the gas station scene. The girl is also a ghost just like their friend they're chasing. What's more, she has a book about beekeeping. The agent surmise that Clay is on his way to Boston. Wallace has gathered together ex-military, explaining to them that a secret organization that isn't disclosed to even the director of the CIA, for decades has operated from the shadows. The beekeepers are given all resources and are allowed to act on their own judgment. But now, a retired beekeeper has gone rogue and isn't acting in the hive's best interest. He calls the former special forces personnel a bunch of babies compared to beekeeper, but maybe with enough of them, they have a chance. Using the psycho woman's finger to enter her facility, Clay has access to all her arsenal and intelligence. Tracking down the base of Derek's operations and stocking up on supplies, Clay sets out to fulfill his promise to Derek. Verona informs the FBI deputy director that three crime scenes are connected with Clay, who is connected to a classified program named Beekeeper. He's on his way to Boston and his next target is Nine Star United, which oversees all of Derek's global scam call centers. The director heard enough, granting the agents full funding to deal with Clay, something that never happens. The FBI SWAT team storms the building, but the private security has it on lock. They settle for a perimeter outside. The team goes through all the other entrances this building has, but there is none. Clay himself confirms it, otherwise he would have used it. He doesn't want to injure anyone unnecessarily, but the SWAT team leaves him no choice. While being surrounded, he somehow just pulverizes 15 armed men, and with one of them as a hostage walks in through the front. Meanwhile in the building, the mercenary commander, Pettis, tries to evacuate anyone who isn't armed, but the ringleader, Golden Goose, refuses. He arrogantly calls up Derek, who in turn chastises Pettis for not doing his job properly. No one will evacuate. As they applaud the armed men leaving, Clay is amongst them. Throwing a guy around, he silences the floor and the Golden Goose still doesn't comprehend the situation. But when Pettis' men start blasting, he's quick to kiss the floor. Clay manages to run to the hallway and climb up the ceiling. With one man down as bait, he deals with two more. To mask sound, he triggers the fire alarm and pounces on Pettis' weapon, neutralizing a few more before disarming him. Whipping out an axe, Clay grabs a fire extinguisher, blinding Pettis and boinks him out. With more agents on the street, 
Verona commands them to roll in. Clay sets up wires for his next plan. Just as the mercenaries think they have him cornered in an elevator, he blows the cable wire, taking those who ran out down with the elevator. Crashing at the bottom, the agents prefer to take the stairs anyway. With the mercenary chain of command in disarray, they are just sitting ducks for Clay to pick off in the dark. With all of them dead, the Golden Goose is next on the chopping block. Using Stapler as a torture device, Clay wants to know who's above him, explaining in the process why he's doing it. It's all because they messed with the only person that ever took care of him. The Golden Goose finally cracks, showing him the top dogs in the charade. Finally Verona made her way there. Directly speaking with Clay, she assures him there are laws for these things, but Clay mentions there are things laws can't fix, but he can, making his escape as the rest of the agents arrive. For now they settle for the Golden Goose and his crew. Looking at the laptop, Verona now also knows who Clay's target is. At some luxurious restaurant, Derek is worried sick and Wallace receives the dire news. His mercenary guys are all dead. Maybe it's time to call Derek's mother. Clay can't take action if they're in Jessica's and her people's proximity. Derek loves the idea. Derek rings her up, without disclosing his Clay situation. He asks if he can visit her and she agrees. Turns out Jessica is the President of the United States of America. No way Clay can exterminate the Queen Bee, right? Verona's agent friend mentions that maybe it's a good idea just to let Clay do his thing. But she can't, even if it's the morally right thing to do. Verona informs the FBI deputy director that Clay is following the money. Nine Star United uses data mining software to identify people with no heirs or family, targeting their assets. But there is another company involved which several US government agencies use. Both operated by Danforth Enterprises, founded and operated by Jessica Danforth, who recently stepped down because she was sworn in as the president. They are the only three that know of this and the deputy director wants to keep it that way. Due to Jessica's association with the scam, Derek might not be the only one on the chopping block. The president is in danger. At the Danforth Beach House, the security is tight, but Verona is there to make it tighter. Derek is already there, chilling, having a beer. But Wallace can't stop panicking, like this amount of secret service agents isn't enough to stop one man. Wallace even hired the most elite team he could think of. Yellow has killed one beekeeper before, at a cost though, hoping to be this lucky this time around as well. Jessica is furious no one notified her of what's at stake. The secret service goes as far as welding shut every manhole around the estate, and thoroughly checking every vehicle that comes through. Making his way into the sewer system, the welded lid doesn't stop Clay from opening the manhole, hopping on a skateboard and making his way to a car in front. But one of the agents spots Clay, but before he could make a sound, Clay incapacitates him and stuffs him in. Now Clay has the perfect disguise to just waltz in. With Yellow's kill squad arriving, the place might be the most secure location on the entire earth. Not even Rambo could break through, but did Rambo have timed explosives? Changing into a suit, here begins the next part of Clay's plan. Just blend in with the rest of the guests. Verona sees the deputy director speaking with the president, understanding that she's learning the truth. Grabbing her son, they go into a private room, where only three of them remain. The deputy director calls out the family about his concerns involving illegal money, and Jessica directs the question to Derek, as the head of the business. This makes him uneasy. Looking for his targets, Clay is spotted by Verona and he gives her a nod, but she notifies all secret services that Clay is in the house. The kill squad is also in action. Finding him outside, with all guns on him, Clay is about to surrender. But what's that in his hand? Wallace gives a go sign for an execution, but Clay doesn't think so. Blowing up the cars is enough of a distraction to shoot a few guys and make his way into the house. Yellow still isn't out of it. Clay wants as few deaths as possible, taking an agent hostage ensures him a safe passage. In the yard, he dismantles the kill squad members one by one, surely making his way to the main target, who at this point starts a family feud. Jessica blames it all on Derek, but without the illegal funding for her campaign, she would never have won the election. Turns out Jessica never knew where the money came from, but Derek isn't about morals, he just needed to get the job done. Like clockwork, Clay goes through the agents without anyone shooting him in the back or anything like that, he got all his angles covered alone. Jessica decides that she will tell Clay and the whole world the truth about Derek's use of the data mining software, even if it costs her everything. Clay is seconds away from the room with Derek and co, but Yellow is a tough nut to crack. The two go hand-to-hand -hand combat, throwing each other around. At this point I'm sure that Clay is like a Terminator and Yellow isn't the T-1000. Psych. Or is he? Nope. The missing leg was the problem. Yellow is dead. At this point, Verona might be the only one Clay has a soft spot for. While stopping his bleeding, Wallace tells Clay that he has proved his point, he can still turn back, live a quiet life. But they are way past that point, it's personal for Clay and he is here to right the wrongs. He plants a claymore on the door and sits Wallace down. 
As Clay is about to make his entrance, Derek shoots the director and takes his mother hostage the moment Clay blows up the door and enters. Verona also makes her entrance and there's a standoff. Clay tells Verona to decide, she works for the law or for justice. He one taps Derek and makes his escape. President is unharmed. Verona still has a shot, but she chooses justice. Clay gives her a final nod, before leaping away, where he has a suit stashed with swim gear. He is out. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this.